Hi again everybody, I am back with another vlog post and today we're going to be talking about my all-time favorite TV show, hands down, no question, way above the rest, the original Twilight Zone. I love this show, I think this is the, just the, the pinnacle of TV. Uh, now the reason I say that, it's, it, it crossed so many different genres. I mean you had horror, you had science fiction, you had suspense, you had comedy. If you've never seen the original Twilight Zone, do yourself a favor. Just just watch an episode. It is just an amazing show uh, written by the late, great Rod Serling. He uh, just had a mind for this stuff like you would not believe. Uh, no, there were other great writers, you know, science fiction writers at the time that, that created a lot of these episodes. Um, but his personal experiences as a paratrooper in World War II kind of, you know, laid the groundwork for some of the things that, that he incorporates into the show. Um... I was introduced to the show at a very young age. I was probably three, four years old when I first saw it. Uh, my grandmother was the one that, that showed it to me. Uh, much like Star Trek, it was about the time I, I picked up on Star Trek and, and the uh, 1960s Batman show, which I've done a video on before. Uh, Star Trek I'll, I'll eventually get to. Uh, but I just, I loved it right off the bat. Uh, I, I've had a love for science fiction and horror from the time I was a little kid. And to me, this is like the pinnacle of science fiction. I mean, un believable series. It ran for five seasons, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, the first three were half an hour episodes. Season four went to a one hour format, which wasn't as popular, but did have a lot of good episodes in there as well. And then the final season, they, they went back to half an hour episodes. I could spend a week talking about all my favorite episodes. I mean, there's at least 50 of this show that I love, um, but I kind of it took me a little while, and it wasn't easy, but I whittled it down, and I narrowed it down to my top ten episodes. So I'm going to talk about them real quick, uh, and then I'm going to... This is a little series, so I'm going to do... This first video is going to be up the, about the original series, which, to me, was was the greatest of all. Uh, subsequent videos are going to be about the 1980s series, the 2000 series, the remake that, that that's on there now, uh, the movie... And a show that Rod Serling did after The Twilight Zone called The Night Gallery, which was pretty good in its own right. Nowhere near as good as, as The Twilight Zone. But uh, anyway, like I said, there are at least 50 episodes of the show that I just, I love. Uh, I could watch them time and time again. Uh, when I was a kid, I loved New Year's uh, because every New Year's there'd be a 24-hour marathon, which, you know, still goes on to this day. Um, nowadays it's on sci-fi, I think, on the sci-fi channel, so you kind of know ahead of time what episode's coming out, whereas when I was a kid it was kind of like a surprise, unless you got TV Guide and, like, knew specifically what episode was coming, you just had this, like, anticipation of, like, oh man, I hope it's gonna be one of my, one of my favorites, you know? Um, so like I said, I whittled the list down to, to ten episodes that I really love, I mean, I, I, it's hard, because there's so many great episodes in the show, uh, Okay, it was been on. It's been on since 1959, so there's going to be a little bit of spoilers here. If you haven't seen The Twilight Zone, shame on you. Go go on YouTube. Go on, uh, you know, Hulu. Go on Netflix. It's on CBS All Access. It's on a couple different things. Watch some of these episodes. They are just incredible. Um, like I said, the bulk of them are half an hour. Uh, that one season, I believe it was season four, that had the hour-long episodes. There, there's some good ones in there. You know, there, there's a couple of duds. And, you know, not every episode of per is perfect, but, you know, what, what show is not like that? Uh, so let me talk about my ten favorite episodes, and then we'll move on to the next video. Okay. Uh, they're not really in any particular order, per se, but, you know, I'll end with what not only was my favorite episode of the entire series, but I think is one of... It's recognized as one of the greatest achievements in television history, so we'll, we'll get to that. So, top ten. Uh, number ten would be called The After Hours. This is a great episode. It, it got uh, a uh, subsequent remake, or reimagining, however you want to call it, in the 1980s series. Um, basically, a woman uh, is in a shopping, uh, you know, shopping store, uh, you know, like Penny's kind of, Penny, Macy's getting a little tongue twisted here. Uh, she's looking for a gift for somebody, and she can't find anything. She's going all over the store. So uh, I don't remember if it was suggested to her or if she just gets on an elevator and she goes up to, like, the fourth floor, and it's kind of deserted except for this one really, like, weird, pushy sales lady and one little thimble in a in a display case. So she gets the thimble, you know, uh, comes back the next day. I guess she wasn't happy with it. She wants to return it, you know. 
So she wants to go back up to the fourth floor, and everybody's like, man, we only have three floors. We don't have a fourth floor. There's there's nothing up there. And she's like, she's insistent. Like, no, I was on the fourth floor. I'm not crazy. They take her up there, nothing. They bring her back down, and she's looking all around the store, and she, like, sees the lady from behind. She's like, oh, that that's the lady who sold it to me. And then, like, two workers in the store pick it up and, like, spin it around, and she's a mannequin. So the lady freaks out, and she passes out, and they take her to, like, the manager's office, you know, and the... The one, the one sales floor manager is like, you know, she's she's cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs, whatever. Um, well, she wakes up later that night, and the store is, like, deserted. She's like, well, what, did they lock me in here? What the hell happened, you know? And uh, so she starts he hearing people, like, calling her name. And, uh, you know, she running all around the store. She sees, like, these mannequins that she thinks are talking to her or whatnot. Uh, gets back in the elevator, ends up on that floor, and of course, the, when the door opens, it's like the mannequin of the lady who sold it to her, you know, so she, like, loses it, she drops to her, to her knees on the floor, and she's, like, bawling and, and out of it, and, uh, the lady picks her up, and she's like, you know, you've forgotten who you are, you know, everybody's telling her, remember, remember, well, it turns out, she's a mannequin as well, and what the mannequins do is each one of them takes turns. They get 30 days out in the real world, and then they have to come back. So that was just a really, really cool episode. Um, another one I really like is called Number 9, sorry, uh, Mirror Image. Now, in this one, there's a young lady uh, who's sitting in a bus station late at night. She's the only one in there. She's waiting for a bus, and she goes to the bathroom, but, like, her suitcase moves. And then she does something else. She goes up to the counter to ask the guy, uh, you know, hey, do you know when the bus comes in? He's like, I told you five minutes ago, it's the same time. And she's like, what are you talking about? I was just in the restroom. I didn't... So all these very weird things happen to her. And she's kind of, like, losing her mind. So there's a, another young man that comes in, and, uh, you know, he's trying to calm her down, relax her, and he's trying to talk to the other guy. And the guy's like, dude, she's been up here, like, multiple times, and all this weird stuff happens. Well, she thinks... Like, she goes into the restroom, and she sees herself, like, in the mirror, but, like, not looking at her, like, another one of herself, you know? So everybody thinks she's nuts or whatnot, and uh, they're all trying to calm her down, and the cops come and kind of take her out of there, and, uh, you know, this long, drawn-out story. Well, then the younger guy that was trying to calm her down, he sees himself, so he starts chasing him, and it's this whole, like, parallel universe thing going on, so that, that, would, that was a really cool one. Um, okay, another one I love, number eight called The Howling Man. There's a guy, he's backpacking through Europe, which I guess is a thing rich people do. I don't know. I, I've heard it a lot. I've never done it, uh, obviously. Um, so he, he's, he's out in this rainstorm. He's getting sick. He ends up uh, finding this monastery. So, you know, they don't want to let him in, but he's like, please, I'm, I'm sick. I'm out in the rain. You know, help me out. Anyway, they let him in. They're like, okay, you can stay one night, and that's it. You're out the door. So he hears this howling while he's in his room. And he's asking the guys, what the heck is that? Oh, it, it, nothing. It's the wind. Don't don't worry about it. So he ends up talking to the head of the monastery. And the guy's like, uh, you know, you can't stay here. You know, this is a little brotherhood. You, you got to go. You got to go. He's like, no, no, please. I'm not feeling well. Just let me stay one night. Well, as he's walking back to his room, he walks through this sort of like jail area. And he hears this howling again. And it's coming from a cell. And it's a guy in there. And he's just howling like a wolf. And he's like, dude, what, what are you, do what are you doing? You know, um, you know. So they, they, he's kind of talking to the guy in the cell, and he's like, you know, please let me out, let me out, please anything. Um, so then, you know, the the people from the monastery find him and kind of shimmy him away and put him back in his room. And uh, the next morning, he wants to talk to you know the head of the monastery again. He's like, who is this guy you're keeping prisoner? He's like, nobody. We don't have any prisoners here. He's like, I was just talking to him. I just saw him. What are you talking about, man? He's like, there's no man in that cell. What? And he's like pressing him. You know, what are you talking about? He's like, in that cell is the devil himself. And of course, the guy's like, you're nuts, man. You're, you're just one of like religious fanatics. You're kooks, you know? So he, he works his way back in to talking to the guy. And uh, he's like, you know, let me out. Let me out. And as, as the other guy's looking at the door, he's like, well, hold on. There's just this little like twig that's holding the door closed. And he could reach through and easily pick it up, you know? And he's like, just reach through and pick it up. He's like, no, 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 there's no time for that. Please, please, let me, you know? So anyway, like an idiot, he, you know, he, he opens it and he lets the guy out. And they're walking away and it was the devil. <laughs> he was just disguising him, you know? So he kind of like 
does this magic trick where he paralyzes the guy, he turns into a bat or whatever, and he flies off. And it ends up causing World War II to start. So, another really cool episode. Okay, number seven. This is a great, great episode. This is another one that got remade in a uh, sub subsequent series here. The Monsters Are Due on Maple Street. So, um, you know, summertime, your average American suburb, your typical American street, you know, and the power goes out. So, all this weird stuff starts happening. And everybody, you know, at that time, it was just a different time. People were out in the street. They were more, uh, you know, communicated with their neighbors, whatnot. Well... You know, they're all out in the street, and the one little kid's got a comic book where he's reading something about aliens, or whatever, you know. And, uh, you know, well, this guy's lights go on. And then they go over there, and like, well, why are your lights on? You know, and then they cut off, and then somebody else's lights go on, and they're like, well, why are your lights on? So they, just this whole long, drawn-out thing where they're, like, pitting everybody against each other out of fear and whatnot. And it turns out that it was aliens were manipulating it, but it's, it's an excellent, excellent story. Um, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, not an analogy, microcosm, wh whatever the word is, of like terror and how when people get scared, they lose complete rational thinking. So, excellent episode. Highly recommend you check that out. Okay, number six. This is another one like that, kind of in, in a similar sort of vein. It's called The Obsolete Man. This is set in the far totalitarian future where it's like dictatorship and, you know, Kind of like the movie 1984, if you've ever seen that. So there's a guy that's a librarian, and the government has decided that he's obsolete. So they're going to execute him. Um, and basically, you have no say in it. If the government decides you are obsolete, you are, that's it, you're done. You know, they're the, they're the final authority. So the head, uh, I can't remember what his title was, but, you know, the head guy, he's up on this high, high court thing. And, you know, there's the lowly little librarian, uh, you know, played by Burgess Meredith, so, the, you know, the guy up there, Fritz, Fritz Weaver was the other actor, great actor in the Twilight Zone, he was in many episodes, uh, he was actually in the 80s show as well, anyway, he determines that, you know, you're a librarian, uh, you're detriment to society, whatever it is, you know, you're going to be executed, uh, you know, but they'll let you decide how you want to be executed, so he's like, well, I want to be in this room, you know, have a good meal, and then I want to die by, by a bomb. Well, he kind of tricks the guy into coming into this room with him. And he tells him, look, you're in here. The, the place is going to blow up. You're going to die with me. And at first, he's like, I'm not going to die. You know, I'm the, I'm the supreme ruler or whatever, whatever it was, you know. But as it gets closer and closer, the, the librarian's cool as a whistle. The other guy starts freaking out. And he makes some kind of remark about it, like, oh, God, let me out, let me out. Like, right at the last second, he gets out, you know. Bomb goes off, kills the librarian. But because he called out to God, you know, he's now obsolete, so he's in the same boat. So awesome, awesome episode. Okay, so we're getting to the nitty-gritty now. Um, number five, The Grave. This is an incredible episode. This is one of my, obviously, favorite ones. Great cast. It's got Lee Marvin, Lee Van Cleef, uh, what's his name, uh, can't think of his name. The guy that played Roscoe on, on the Dukes of Hazard. I want to say James Best, or, but I'm not sure if that's it. Uh, which I should know because I love the Dukes of Hazard. Anyway, uh, set in the Old West, you know, um, outlaw rides into town and, uh, you know, gets gunned down in the street by, by everybody in town. But nobody, because it was kind of nighttime and windy and dark, nobody knows who fired the kill shot. Anyway, well, he doesn't die. Like, he's, he's severely wounded. So, you know, this is the Old West. So they... They take him back to his mom and his pa, whatever. And, you know, he like he dies the next day, basically. But, you know, he, he's still conscious for a little while. And he's talking about this guy who was supposedly chasing him all over the country, this bounty hunter, played by uh, Lee Marvin. Well, later that night, of course, Lee Marvin shows up and he goes to the bar. And they're like, you know, yeah, we shot him down. But, you know, he said that uh, you were supposed to be chasing him. Every time he slowed down, you'd slow down. Like, you, would, you were too scared to catch him, whatever. They go through this whole long spiel. And, uh... You know, they're like, okay, well, by, by this time the guy's died and, and been buried. I'm sorry, I got, got a little twisted there. Uh, so they're like, well, if you're really not scared of him, you know, if you weren't scared when he was alive, like you say, you shouldn't be scared when he's dead. Go up to the cemetery, here's a knife, plant it in his grave, we'll give you 50 bucks. Which, or, you know, whatever the equivalent was at the time, a lot of money. He's like, I ain't scared of nothing, you know. 
So he goes up to the to the cemetery. He's like, I'll be back, you know, and, and all you guys have been running your mouth. You better get the hell out of here and ne never see you again, whatever. So he gets up to the cemetery, and it's windy as hell. And the guy's, the, the, the outlaw's sister's there, and she's like, oh, yeah, go on up there. He's waiting for you. And she has this, like, really creepy laugh, and she walks off, you know. And she tells him, like, that gun's not going to do you any good in the cemetery. If you go up there, he's going to reach up and grab you. He's like, whatever, you know. So he's making his way through there. Everything's windy, like an outhouse or little shed blows open. The door blows open. He's, you know, freaking out. So he's shooting out at the shed and whatnot. Well, anyway, he eventually gets up the well to go up to the, to the uh, you know, to the grave site, takes his knife, buries it. And as he's turning around, you see him fall. Like, you don't see the whole, they, they kind of, like, minimize the screen, but you see, him, you see him fall. So back at the bar, they're like, you know, he, he never came back, man. You know, one of the guys is like, I, I think we got him killed. We got to go up there. And they're like, no, 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 just wait till morning. We'll, we'll all go up there together. Next morning, they go to the cemetery. And sure enough, he's laying dead across the, uh, across the, the outlaw's grave, you know. And they're like, man, you know, I, I knew we got this guy killed. We shouldn't, have, you know, we shouldn't have egged him on. And uh, they're trying to figure it out. And they're like, well, you know, we scared the hell out of him. Look, it's obviously what happened. The wind was blowing. He put the knife through his own coat when he stood up he felt the tug and you know he had a heart attack thinking it was it was the guy reaching up well then the creepy ass sister comes along and she's like hmm what way was the wind blowing last night and they're like oh you know east is whatever like blowing away from the grave like to where the knife could not have been you know put in the grave and she holds up her little coat that she's got and it's blowing she's like same way as blowing now and they're like, yeah, why? And they're like, there's no way he would have been able to plant the knife in his coat that the guy did reach up and grab him. So awesome, awesome episode. Okay, because uh, I'm getting a little late here. I want to make sure I get this all in before we, we go too long. Number four, awesome. love this episode. Will the real Martian please stand up? Uh, two state troopers get a call about a UFO landing in a pond. Uh, so they go to investigate, can't find anything, but they do find tracks coming out of this pond to, uh, you know, like a mile down the road or whatever. So they follow the tracks and it comes up to a diner, middle of the night, you know, snowing like hell. Uh, there's all these people. There was like the bus driver, one guy that had been in there, uh, you know, running the, running the joint. And uh, I don't know, six or seven people. I can't remember the exact number. So the cops come in and kind of tell them what's going on. And the bus driver's like, no, there were six of us, what, whatever, you know. And they're like, well, there's seven of you in here. They don't count the guy working there. And he's like, well, well, hold on a minute. No, no, I was sure there were six of us. And, and so they kind of talk amongst the, themselves like, who? Wait, no, I saw you on the bus. I didn't see you. So everybody getting suspicious. All this weird stuff starts happening. The light's going off. The, you know, the jukebox is going uh, on and off. The, the phone is ringing. Anyway, long story short, there's a, there's a bridge that they were trying to go across. And uh, the bus driver's like, no, I'm not doing it. The bridge is out with all the snow. I'm waiting until the county says it's safe to go. Uh, you know, so it's just it's just all this awesome banter back and forth from the characters as they get suspicious suspicious of each other. Um, anyway, phone rings, cop picks it up. Okay, we're good to go. Everybody back on the bus, and they can't figure out. They they still haven't determined who's this visitor that whatever you know. Anyway, they get back on the bus. They drive. You hear the crunching of metal sound. You know whatever. And then a little while later. One, one of the people that was in there walks back in and the guy running the place he's like hey wait a minute I thought you were on that the bus and he's like I was on that bus the bridge was out we went into the water and da 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 so he was the Martian that came from that ship in the pond only he didn't you know take into consideration he's like you know my people are loving this planet we're going to come colonize it but what he doesn't realize is the guy running the diner was from Venus and intercepted their people and their people are going to colonize the planet. So anyway, just, just really, really great episode. Okay, number two, three, three, number three. Uh, I'm trying to hurry. To serve man. This, is, this one is one my cousin loves as well. Uh, these huge eight or nine foot aliens come down to Earth and, you know, everybody's freaking out. They don't know what to do. Uh, you know, so they go to the United Nations, you know, they're, they're hovering all over the planet, go to the United Nations, and they look, they're like, look, we're here in peace, we're here to help you, all that's all we want to do, we want to help you, uh, you know, and they leave a book, and they're like, we just want to help. So, uh, of course, the military's on high alert, you know, and, and the, the, the main character of the story is this guy, he's like a, a translator, so, something with the military, FBI, something like that. 
and he's trying to figure out what the heck this book says. Well, in the meanwhile, uh, you know, the aliens are giving all these demonstrations. They're turning, like, deserts into, like, lush fields of, of crop, and, you know, they're solving the hunger problem, and, you know, little by little, you know, as time goes on, he's still working on this book with this other girl trying to translate it. Well, they translate the title to serve man. He doesn't think much, much of it, da 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 so, you know, maybe like a year or something goes by, and then, uh, you know, there's no more wars, everything's peaceful, everybody's fed, you know, disease is gone, all the weapons of war are gone, and uh, they start a program where they're taking humans back to their planet, like an exchange program. So, uh, the guy who had been trying to translate it, he's like, eh, I'm getting on the ship, I bought a ticket, you know, we're gonna, I'm gonna go. Well... <laughs> You know, he's he's getting on the ship, and the lady comes running up, and she's like, Stop! Stop! Don't get on there! The rest of the book, it's a cookbook! So they're trying to fatten up the planet and eat humans, and just awesome, awesome episode. Okay, I'm a little over 20 minutes, so let me hurry it up. Number two, five characters in search of an exit. Love this episode. Uh, there's a clown, an army major, a ballerina, a hobo, and a bagpipe player. And they're in this, like cylindrical thing with like 50 something foot high walls there's no escape they're just in this thing all they see is they kind of see like the moon and and clouds and stuff up above but they can't figure out who they are they have no memory of who they are how they got there um you know what they're doing how to get out they're checking everything the army major is freaking out he's like trying to you know check every square inch of this place and the clown is like dude we've done this trust me there's no escape we don't know if we're in hell, purgatory, whatever. But he doesn't want to quit. So they keep trying all these different things. Nothing works. So there's just there's this great banter back and forth between all the characters. Awesome. Well, they finally decide, let's get on everybody's shoulders. Let's go over the top, you know. Well, they, they try it. And then there's this, like, loud bell sound. And the whole place rattles and they all fall down. Uh, and But they realize they were, they were close, you know. So they, they're going to try it again. Uh, they get the major saber and they tear some of their clothes and... They're going to make kind of like a makeshift uh, grappling hook. So they do it again. They throw the grappling hook. The major gets up. He looks at the top and they're like, what is it? What is it? And then he falls into uh, the snow and they're like, oh my God, he died. You know, we're left down here. And then you see a little girl pick up a like little G.I. Joe figure and put it back in like the Salvation Army thing for Christmas that they were just like five little donation dolls so great great story okay number one because i'm already at 22 minutes let me try to hurry it up this is the one i was talking about that is not only i in my opinion uh, and this is a lot of people's opinion not only the greatest episode of the series but one of the greatest episodes in television history okay it starts and and you have to really pay attention it starts with a lady her head is completely bandaged uh, all you see is like you know like just a little bit of her chin and she's talking about how she's uh, she's so ugly and she's deformed and she's had, I think it was 10 surgeries. Uh, this is her final chance. You know, after this, the, the government w won't continue to, to, to pay for it. You know, they're going to say, well, you're going to have to go live with people your kind. So, you know, you keep seeing doctors and nurses and stuff. And like the very first time I, I saw it, I didn't realize it. Like in subsequent viewings, you'll realize it. That you never really see anybody's face. They're always hidden by shadow or just by camera trick or whatever. So, uh, you know, they're telling her, well, if, if the surgery doesn't work, we're going to put you in this, this community for, for people like you. And she's freaking out, you know, like, oh, like for freaks like me or whatever, you know. Anyway, long story short. Uh, so something happens. I, God, you would think I would remember these things. But she's, she's like, I can't take it anymore. I, I can't wait. Take this thing off my head. I have to know. <coughs> they're like, look, we don't know if you're ready. She's like, I don't care. Do it. So, little by little, they start unraveling, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the bandages on her head, this thing that's got her completely wrapped. And they get to the final level, and they're like, look, we told you, this is number 11. You're not going to get another crack at this. If it doesn't work, you're just going to have to go live in this community for people like you. She's like, fine. So, they take the final ring off, and the doctor drops the, the scissors that were cut, and he's like, didn't work. It didn't work. And you see her, and she's this beautiful woman. So she freaks, and she tries to go running away, and they kind of grab her and stop her. And as they turn, they're like pig-faced people. 
Like, just awesome. Awesome reveal. Like, I was, like, mind-blown when I was a little kid. Like, incredible episode. So, if you have not seen it, definitely see that one. Like I said, they have made subsequent uh, remakes of that episode. So, okay, I know this one went a little bit long. I do apologize. It's just I have such passion for the show. Um, if you like my videos, please make sure you subscribe. Uh, hit the, you know, hit the... Uh, little notification bell so when I do post new videos you'll know like the video make comments uh, I always love to hear back from you guys feedback if I'm doing good doing bad if you're enjoying them if you're not you know please let me know uh, so we're gonna be moving on to the next video here um, just a few minutes I'm gonna be recording it but I'll be posting them separately so that was the end of part one we're gonna pick up Twilight Zone part two talk to you soon